It's Sunday, 24 April. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. We got a follow-on video to the initial video about the tragic loss of the Cessna 208 Grand Caravan in Burley, Idaho, back on 13 April. As we discussed in the first video, it's assumed that the aircraft struck this stack here at the gem processing, potato processing plant, and landed on the roof of the processing plant right here. Now we got some pictures showing just what these obstacles, these stacks look like on short final to runway 20 at Burley. Here's what it looks like at minimums 4560 after descending out of Jamid. And here we can see the stack and the tower perfectly lined up with the runway 20, relatively short runway, just a little over 4,000 feet at Burley, Idaho. So in order to descend out of minimums, of course, you got to have the runway runway environment in sight, and also you got to keep and maintain these obstacles in sight as well. A 3.75 degree glide path, a steeper than normal glide path is required to avoid these obstacles and land on runway 20. As we continue on the descent into the runway, now this is a strong crosswind from right to left, and the aircraft is left of course for runway 20. Normally you would be lined up with the center line of the runway, which would put you right over this small steam cloud here and these obstacles, including this tower right here that the Cessna 208 struck. Unfortunately, on the day of the accident, with one mile of visibility in the snow and eight knots of wind, mostly down the runway, that would take this steam cloud and run it right up the ILS, basically, right along the center line of the runway obscuring the tower that was struck and then even closer in right over the top of the towers there's the steam plume just at the very bottom of the picture you can see the relatively steep 3.75 degree visual glide path to get to the runway 20 numbers to clear these obstacles This regular UPS feeder flight starts out of Salt Lake City routinely. I don't know if that happens every day or every weekday morning, but around seven in the morning and heads up to Burley, Idaho with enough fuel to come all the way back to Salt Lake City. They do not refuel over at Burley. So there should have been plenty of fuel for this operation of doing the approach, missed approach, even a return all the way back to Salt Lake City and or detour to an alternate airport. The alternate airport normally is uh, Twin Falls, located just a few miles right over here. You got Twin Falls and or Pocatello. Twin Falls has a nice ILS approach into that airport with a half mile visibility minimums, weather minimums. Now, a couple of things about operating out of Burley. You're, it's an uncontrolled airport. You're using the automatic weather one minute recording on 135.575 they were down to that one mile of visibility but what do you know about the condition of the runway on these freight type operations sometimes you need to get that information since there's nobody at the airport to help you you maybe need to get that information directly from the truck driver himself or you may need to come in and take a look at the runway condition for yourself on a low approach so the first relatively high speed approach flown by this aircraft may very well have been an effort to make a determination as to what was the actual runway condition with the snow falling in the area at the time to see if it was even safe to make an approach and landing into Burley. Because there's no way of getting the information about snow, the amount of snow that's on the runway. And this is a very common backcountry process of doing a low approach evaluating the landing area, the landing zone, and then come back around and land on it. Because if there's too much snow on the runway or the runway is not plowed, you simply don't want to land in, in that snow. Now, another thing, of course, there's no de-icing capability at Burley Airport also. And so operators have to consider that, well, if it's snowing enough, if the precipitation rate is heavy enough, do I want to risk getting stuck at Burley while I'm unloading the boxes at Burley and the snow's falling on top of the aircraft and then 
and now the air the wings get covered with snow am i gonna have to get de-iced or you can't get de-iced you're basically stuck in burley until you can clear all the snow off of the wings of your aircraft so if it's snowing very much at burley you may just hang it up and head over to twin or a suitable alternate or all the way back to salt lake city and wait for the weather to improve the point being that there's a lot of reasons to not get into Burley and a lot of the pressure to get the job done is largely self-imposed pressures. We put the pressure on ourselves to try to get the job done. Now, this particular Cessna caravan does have de-icing capability. This was the wing weeping style of de-icing capability on this particular aircraft. Um, and on these aircraft if you are operating in icing conditions it's common to use a no flap landing or a only 20 degrees of flaps on landing when operating in icing conditions so your stall speed is going to be up and your approach speed is going to be up as well locals who operate out of here all the time on less windy days when this steam column is standing a little more vertically they know that they oftentimes have to fly right through this steam cloud to maintain the glide path to land on the runway. So even though you're below minimums on an instrument approach, you've got your runway airport environment in sight. Sometimes landing at this airport with this setup, you temporarily lose sight of the runway flying through the steam cloud. It only takes a second or two to get through the steam cloud, but you know at which time that you're going to break out of it and uh, regain sight of the airport. Now, technically, legally, if you lose sight of the landing runway, when below minimums, you need to go missed approach. So just a horrible, horrible setup with these obstacles, these towers, and this obscuration from the steam cloud directly in line on short final for this runway. So investigators are going to be spending a lot of time looking at these obstacles, making sure do these obstacles meet TERP's criteria for this instrument approach? Was this instrument approach properly certified by the FAA to meet these obstacle requirements? And for the Garmin G1000 community, the visual, do you have a proper visual descent path from minimums to the threshold crossing height over the runway? that clears these obstacles at 3.75 degrees. As we learn more, it raises more questions. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.